Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Gamer's Hearth, the podcast formerly known as Cup of Cozy. Yes, we did have a name change for the podcast, which is definitely odd considering only one episode had come out as Cup of Cozy. If you're interested in seeing the reasoning behind the name change, I do have that written out on my website. There's going to be a link to that in the description or the show notes, so you can go and look at that. But I chose The Gamer's Hearth as a name because I feel that it really encompasses the idea of cozy community that I really want to bring to this podcast. The definition of hearth, according to my dictionary app, aka Google on my phone, is the floor of a fireplace, a crackling blaze on the hearth, the area in front of a fireplace they were sitting around the hearth, or used as a symbol of one's home. He left hearth and home to train in Denmark. What I would really love this podcast to feel like is that we are sitting around a hearth together talking about something that we are passionate about. And that is the reasoning behind that name in particular. So let me be the first one to welcome you to the gamer's hearth. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about the evolution and history of cozy games. As a person whose formative years took place in the 2000s, I feel like I had this unique experience, well, me and everybody else who was playing cozy games at that time, but we had the experience of really having to go out and hunt down, track down cozy games. The amount and the variety were very slim. We would sometimes have to wait months or years for another similar game game to come out. And now we've gone from that to today where I literally feel like I don't have time to play all of the games that look amazing that I'm really, really interested in. So we're going to be talking about how we got here, what the landscape of cozy gaming looks like today, and I'll make a few predictions about what I think cozy gaming is going to look like going forward. We're going to look at everything from classic titles to contemporary releases and pay special attention to the trends and transformations that have shaped the cozy game landscape. I've divided this information into different sections, so this is section one, the origins. Interestingly, I think a lot of the games that came out in the very early days of gaming, and by that I mean like the 70s, the 80s, and I know that there is a lot of very rich video game history just within that time period. We're going to be kind of lumping everything together because that's just not the focus of this video. But I think that a lot of the games that came out during that time would be considered cozy games if they came out today. Now, I do think that this is really just due to the graphical and programming limitations of the time period, but things like Tetris, Pac-Man, and then even later Solitaire and that little pinball game that was on Windows computers, they do have a lot of hallmarks of things that we look for now when we are naming something a cozy game. So things like simple graphics and gameplay, low stakes, a sense of relaxation and distraction, and even the arcades of the 70s and 80s and 90s provided something that people also look for in their cozy gaming, which is a sense of community and social interaction. But whereas with the arcades of that time, and yes, arcades do still exist, actually there are some really cool retro arcades that I've seen popping up, which I really like to go to, but they're definitely not as much of a staple now. I feel like during those time periods, there were certain games where if you wanted to play them, you had to go to the arcade, but now we have a lot more games at our fingertips. But anyways, when you were at an arcade, you were very tangibly getting that sense of community. You were literally there with other people in your community. You had lots of opportunities for social interaction, whether that was with the people that came with you or if it was you meeting new people at the arcade. Plus, you had this sense of community within the games to a certain extent because you could see other people's high scores and those would be people in your community. In gaming today, we mostly see that in the form of online or multiplayer experiences. And we also see it to a certain extent with social interactions between your character and NPCs. So things like friendship mechanics, romance mechanics, stuff like that. So am I saying that we need to look back at Tetris and Donkey Kong as the pinnacle or the origin story of cozy gaming. 
No. But what I am saying is that things like community, relaxation, aesthetically pleasing graphical experience, these are all things that gamers have always sought out. I feel that the cozy game industry has in a lot of ways become very masterful at creating a a one-stop shop for all of these things that people can be seeking out in those games. There are a lot of reasons people choose to play video games and it's not just the reasons that I've been talking about. A lot of people really enjoy competitiveness. They enjoy seeking mastery over skills related to their games. But what the cozy gaming industry has done really, really well in the last couple years. And when I say that, I'm talking about developers. I'm talking about content creators. I'm talking about people creating forums and spaces like Reddit and Discord and stuff like that to talk about these types of games. What the cozy gaming industry has done really, really well in the last couple of years is finding that community and saying, hey, for us that like this, 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 and this in our games, these are games that will really appeal to that particular play style that you have. Getting ahead of myself, we will come back to that. But first, First, I want to talk about section two, which is Harvest Moon, Animal Crossing, and the simulation era. The late 90s and early 2000s was a huge turning point for what would become the cozy gaming industry because this is when we saw three major franchises come onto the scene that are going to absolutely define this space, and that is Harvest Moon. Animal Crossing, and The Sims. The first Harvest Moon game came out in 1996. This is the grandfather, the OG, the creator of the farm sim genre. So this game was created by Yasuhiro Wada, and he was inspired by his childhood in the countryside, as well as a horse racing simulation game that was called Derby Stallion. And this was his attempt to make a role-playing game with no combat. Here we see all of the farm sim tropes that we know and love today. You inherit a farm from your grandfather, you pack up your city life to start a new life in a new town, you grow your farm from nothing and form relationships with the local townspeople. This was my personal introduction to the farm sim genre. Actually, it was not the first one, but it was Harvest Moon DS Cute. Back in the day, the very first Harvest Moon games, you could only play as a boy character and romance the women in the town. And then they made Harvest Moon DS, which of course had the male main character, but then they made a separate game, which was DS Cute, which was the one where you could play as a girl and you could only romance the boys in the town. Obviously we've come a long way since then in terms of representation and in terms terms of including LGBTQIA plus characters, but that's how it was in the early days. That game is still very special to me because it, again, was my very first farm sim. Unlike the oversaturation that we see today, this was the really only game of its kind during this time, and if you wanted a new one, you had to wait years for more to come out. In 2000, the very first game in the Sims franchise was released. There were a lot of simulation games on the market, so things like Sim City, Age of Empires, Oregon Trail. However, The Sims was unique as it allowed players to create and manage virtual lives, homes, and families. So like Harvest Moon, it really marked a significant shift in cozy game development because it emphasized things like player agency, emotional connection, and the joys of nurturing and care, which were not extremely common themes of video games at the time. Another huge moment for Cozy Games was 2001, the very first Animal Crossing game. We will definitely talk more about Animal Crossing in just a little bit, but again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, here we have more of an emphasis on that slow, relaxing gameplay. It's a very low stakes setting, unless of course, you're being yelled at by your villagers, which was way more intense in the earlier Animal Crossing games than it is in Animal Crossing New Horizons, unfortunately, because I think it's very funny. But overall, the comfy coziness of this game is 
absolutely genre defining. These three franchises had a lockdown on the community of gamers that wanted more calm, relaxing, casual gameplay. However, in the 21st century, we saw the next big step towards the cozy gaming landscape that we have today, which is the indie boom. This was an indie revolution that would very profoundly impact the cozy game landscape. So to clarify some definitions really quickly, an indie game or an independent game are developed by individuals like solo developers or small teams usually. This is in opposition to the big mega game publishers. So think Sony, think Nintendo, think Ubisoft, think Activision, think EA. These are things that are usually referred to as triple A. Now the big thing that really defines the difference between these is budget. Indie games tend to have much, much smaller budgets, which is going to affect all kinds of things from artwork to technology to programming, even marketing capabilities. So everything in an indie title is usually going to be on a somewhat small smaller scale. And this may seem like a negative thing. However, it does not mean a worse game. In fact, indie games are usually a lot more free to be creative, to push boundaries, to try out new styles and genres or blend genres together in interesting ways. They can tell radically diverse stories. And this is really due to the fact that they don't have a big stuffy boardroom that they have to answer to about profit. Over the last several years, the popularity and number of indie games has absolutely skyrocketed, which we can attribute to a few factors. Number one, it's just becoming more accessible to make games. New game engines are being created and widely distributed that have made it easier to make games without having to be expert coders, or at least they make it easier to learn the coding required to make games. We also see the rise of Steam as a platform. Steam is obviously a huge platform for all sorts of games games, not just indie games. Having such a large and popular platform that people can upload to has made it a lot easier for people to publish their games. And then we also see social media. The rise of social media has made it easier for developers to connect with other developers. It's made it easier for developers and content creators to interact and spread word about games, as well as developers and journalists. And it's also easier for them to market their games organically on social media as well. One indie game in particular came to the scene in the 2010s. Guess what I'm going to say? Did you guess Stardew Valley? Because yeah, it's Stardew Valley. One indie game came to the scene in the early 2010s that stands out to me as a defining moment for the cozy game genre. Stardew Valley was released in 2016 and it was a labor of love created by a single developer. One single developer did all of the art, programming, writing, music, all of it. It really captured the hearts of players all around the world because it combined elements of farming simulation, role playing and life simulation. So in the game, players assume the role of a character who inherits a rundown farm, giving them the opportunity to cultivate crops, raise animals and engage with the charming residents of the local town, Pelican Town. Eric Barone, the developer himself, has said that he was heavily inspired by the Harvest Moon games, which he loves. And it really took what people loved about the Harvest Moon games and kind of improved upon them in a lot of ways. It modernized them. It added a lot of quality of life improvements. And especially at a time where the quality of the Harvest Moon games was at an all time low, which is a whole topic in and of itself, this was like the game that we all needed, but we didn't know we needed. Stardew Valley was mega and it applied to not just fans of Harvest Moon games and Animal Crossing and The Sims games, but it really brought in a lot of people who maybe didn't have experience with those previous cozy games because it was just so freaking good. What set it apart was its attention to detail, its rich storytelling, and this really genuine sense of coziness, which is kind 
kind of hard for me to put my finger on exactly. I think it's really just a combination of the setting. It encourages you to take a break from the hustle and bustle of real life. You know, you're literally doing that while you're playing the game, but you're also doing it within the game world itself. You have the very predictable cycle of seasons. You have the camaraderie of the townspeople, and you also have that freedom to just pursue the various tasks around town and around your farm at your own pace. So it really created this sense of relaxation and contentment. So this is section four, COVID-19 and the indie boom continues. COVID-19 led to a big boom in the indie and cozy game space. It was like the perfect storm of factors to create this environment that was extremely conducive to a boom of indie and cozy games. For one, Lots of indie developers attribute the beginning of their game development journey to lockdown. So developers who either lost their jobs or needed to find alternatives to traditional work, they had the time and the space to begin working on their passion projects. And then some people also turned toward this out of necessity as well. In addition to that, consumers of games were even more so than usual looking for what Cozy Games had to offer them. That sense of routine, the sense of relaxation and distraction, the sense of emotional connection, social connection at a time when we were all socially distancing from one another. And of course, we can't talk about cozy gaming and COVID without talking about a particular game. I will give you one guess. If you guessed Animal Crossing, you are correct. <laughs> of course, everyone was playing Animal Crossing, casual gamers, non-casual gamers, and even people who had literally never picked up a video game before were all playing Animal Crossing. There are a lot of people that I am friends with within the cozy game space who say that they got their start playing cozy games because of Animal Crossing. They bought a Switch just to play Animal Crossing, and then this led them to entering this lovely world of gaming and cozy gaming. Animal Crossing was huge because it allowed us to relax, have a sense of control and accomplishment. It allowed us to connect with one another. Some of my fondest memories from that very difficult time was hanging out with friends and families and going to each other's islands. I think another big thing with Animal Crossing was the fact that it ran on real time and they had time restrictions for a lot of things. And so it really gave people something to look forward to every single day. Nowadays, when people play Animal Crossing, it almost feels like the default way is to play through time travel. But at the very beginning, not as many people were time traveling. I definitely wasn't time traveling at the beginning. You know, everything takes like a day, right? So you move a house and the house is gonna be moved the next day, but once the house is moved, then you can start decorating the area where the house is now. I would wake up in the morning and I would be so excited because my house moved today, there's fresh stuff in Nook's Cranny and I can continue on with the tasks that I had been planning. And like I said earlier, this game was mega. So many people bought their very first gaming platform to play Animal Crossing and we we had scads of brand new baby gamers entering the space or also people coming back into the space, which was kind of my situation, who would eventually start to branch out and search for more similar games. So there was this hunger, there was this desire for more and more games that gave that feeling that Animal Crossing gave. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, even people who were gamers, but not necessarily cozy gamers, were playing and enjoying Animal Crossing a lot. And I think that also helped to add a lot of legitimacy to the genre. In addition to Animal Crossing New Horizons, Stardew Valley was gaining more and more of an audience during this time. And this was due to a couple of things. It was coming out on more platforms so it could reach a wider audience. It was spreading due to word of mouth because of more and more people going on to online spaces to talk about games that they loved. A lot of people started playing Stardew Valley because they went on and started asking people, well, what game should I play besides Animal Crossing? I want 
want more. And despite them being different in a lot of significant ways, Stardew Valley does often get recommended to people who are looking for really any cozy game. So along with those two things happening, developers began to see that this was a gap in the market that they could capitalize on. And it sounds a little bit cynical to say it that way. And I definitely think that there are developers who purely see it as something to capitalize on. But I also think that there are a lot of developers who had held on to ideas but never acted on them since they thought no one would care to begin with. They saw that, yes, like people do care about this. People will play these types of games and they want more. So this is a good opportunity to make that game that I've been thinking about. So all of this really paved the way for the resurgence of cozy in games. Developers and players alike recognize the appeal of these comforting experiences and we saw more and more similar titles spring up. Now some of these did come out before 2020. I do want to make that very clear. It wasn't like there were no cozy games besides Stardew Valley until Animal Crossing New Horizons. For example, Spiritfarer, My Time at Portia, Graveyard Keeper, these games came out before Animal Crossing New Horizons. I do think that their audiences got bigger after 2020, and there's definitely tons and tons of games that have come onto the scene since that time. I could just list so many. This is section five, diversity in cozy gaming. In the last five to 10 years, cozy games have evolved a lot, not only in terms of their gameplay, but also in the realm of representation and inclusivity. Developers have increasingly focused on creating characters and stories that resonate with a broader audience. And I would argue that indie games and cozy games specifically are often the trailblazers of representation, diversity, and inclusivity in games. I think this is due to a couple of reasons. Audiences and fans of cozy games, and by extension, their developers, tend to have a higher proportion of people that come from groups that have been historically underrepresented in gaming. And that is not to say that this is a perfect environment that is free from any bigotry or discrimination, but I do think that we see a much better proportion of diversity in cozy games and indie games than we often see in traditionally published AAA games. Because they are indie games, they aren't beholden to, again, stuffy boardrooms of people who are going to be worried about boycotts and backlash from racist and homophobic people and how that is going to cut into their profits. And it's becoming a bit of a lovely self-fulfilling prophecy as well. The diversity and representation that is found in cozy games tends to attract more people who care about that and then they continue to consume and develop more content within that space. And this is section six, the current landscape. So we have all the cozy games that we could want. No problem, right? We're good? Everything is good? Yes, but there are some issues that people are starting to have within the space. Number one is fatigue. Particularly, I've seen people lately talking about farm sim fatigue, which is this sense of feeling like they're playing a similar game over and over and over again. You know, there's kind of this like meme or this joke almost where like, oh, it's another farm sim. It's another farm sim. And kind of along with that is sameness. A lot of games are starting to feel a little samey to one another. We're seeing quite a lot of overlap in styles of games, which is a hard thing because, you know, when a game is in a genre, games within those genres are going to have similar tropes. They're going to have similar mechanics. They're going to have similar things like that. Of course, just like any genre of, you know, movie or TV show or whatever would have. But... Sometimes it almost feels like games are coming out that are almost like carbon copies of one another with just slight differences. And this sameness can make people feel, again, that kind of leads back into the fatigue. People are starting to feel fatigue of being shown the same type of game over and over and over again. That issue is a little bit of a double-edged sword in a way because I also have seen the rise of the Stardew ripoff mindset, which is that people will see a farm sim game and be like, like, oh, that's just a Stardew ripoff. That's just a Stardew ripoff. 
which I take issue with because farming sim has become a genre in and of itself. Genres are going to have similar tropes and shared characteristics. Plus that just completely acts like Harvest Moon doesn't exist and that Stardew Valley wasn't a game that was heavily inspired by Harvest Moon. We're also seeing a lot of what I call farming sim but with games. A lot of games that are coming out that are farming sims but they are trying to put a spin on the genre, which I think is a good thing. I think in some instances it works and in some instances it doesn't. But ultimately, I think it's a good thing that farming sims are putting different spins on it, you know, but we have things like, you know, Coral Island, which is farming sim, but it's on an island and it has mermaids. Or Moonlight Peaks, the upcoming game, which is like farming sim, but with vampires and supernatural creatures. Or Sunhaven, which is like farming sim, but with fantasy creatures and magic. Those kinds of things. Another thing that I'm seeing in the current landscape of cozy gaming is a lot of really interesting genre blends. In order to create cozy games that are pushing the envelope, capturing people's attentions, standing out amongst the many, many, many cozy games that are being released, a lot of games are blending genres in interesting ways. So for example, we have Dredge, which is horror and fishing. We have Palea, which is cozy game plus MMO. We have Cult of the Lamb, which is roguelike plus management game. And I really, really like to see those. Those very much like capture my attention. And here is our last section, section seven, the future of cozy gaming, a short little section where I'm gonna talk about where I see cozy games going forward and where I think cozy games should be moving forward. What we do know is that cozy gaming is here to stay. And I expect that we are going to continue to see a lot of new and exciting games, genre blends and fresh ideas. I think we are also going to start to see a lot of large publishers starting to dip their toes in the water to try to capitalize on the cozy game community a little bit, which we are starting to see to a certain extent. So we see things like the game Harvestella from Square Enix. I would argue even Disney Dreamlight Valley to a certain extent. That's a little bit complicated because it's like licensed by Disney. It's not actually Disney Corporation. But anyways, I do worry about that though. As cozy games become less and less indie or we start to see more that are not indie, we're gonna start to see a couple of things happen which can be concerning. One of those is monetization practices, which we are definitely already starting to see some questionable monetization practices coming into the cozy game genre. So things like premium currencies in Palea and Disney Dreamlight Valley. Those are practices that are honestly pretty common in other types of games. Whether or not they're ethical is a whole other topic, but they are starting to now seep into cozy games, which is causing a lot of growing pains in the cozy gaming community because as I've talked about in this episode, a lot of people who came into cozy gaming came in with Stardew Valley, Animal Crossing, or other cozy indie games, and therefore may not be used to these types of monetization practices. So I think they can be a bit of a shock to people. So I worry about the increase of monetization. I also see cozy games along with the gaming industry as a whole starting to move more into live service games where you have games that are going to continue to receive updates for a really long time and you know you may have to continue to pay for those updates through paying for DLC or paying a subscription things like that but kind of going back to cozy gaming in general I think as always cozy games and games in general need to work really hard to improve on representation good quality representation LGBTQIA plus individuals BIPOC individuals disabled individuals continuing to provide more accessibility options for people making the accessibility options more robust is definitely a priority that I think not just cozy gaming but gaming in general needs to move toward and overall I think cozy game developers really do have their work cut out for them in order to make games that stand out. Oversaturation is definitely an issue in the landscape today and cozy gamers have high expectations for their gaming experiences. We're not just accepting carbon copy farm sims anymore, right? They have to bring something new to the table in order for us to choose that game over the dozens of other games that are coming out 
in a similar genre in any given month. I love to watch the transformations and trends that are happening in the cozy gaming space. Do you have any other ideas about where you think this cozy game industry is headed? Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you want to get in contact with me, you can email me at thegamershearth at gmail.com. If you're watching on YouTube, you can also just leave a comment. That's also a good reminder that my podcast is available on YouTube in video format and Apple and Spotify. Thank you so much for listening. I'm having such a blast creating this podcast and I have lots of awesome ideas for content that I want to bring you. There are a lot of topics that I even touched on within this episode that I want to dive into further. Things like accessibility, things like monetization, things like diversity and representation. Lots of good stuff brewing, but thank you so much for listening to this episode and I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Do something cozy today and I'll see you next time we gather around the hearth.